I, I know. Thank you. Gary, now make your request, please. Thank you. I think uh, I wanted to make uh, just a moment. Dr. Curry. I wanted to make Dr. Curry the uh, co host too. Uh, very well. I'll do that and then I'm leaving. All right. Thank you so much. Dr. Curry, the co host. Wow. You're, you're leaving us, Andrew, Your Excellency? Uh, What's the. Huh? Okay. I, I, I'm triple booked. <laughs> <laughs> He has, he, has he has tried for us. And uh, please, I want everyone to mute Israel Mike as we are officially going right now into the business of the day. Please, uh, Dr. Kari, that's why you are, okay. as well as co host, to help us if there's any noise somewhere. I just said goodbye, Andrew. So, nice to see you briefly. Mute. Oh, so Valerie, it's so good her. to see you, my dear. I love you all. And oh, oh, by the way, if everyone could please show your video, we can at least let our audience know that we're all here together. If you could be so kind, now would be that time. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Andrew Williams Jr. Although I'm leaving here, I am your host. Uh, I am the <clears throat> chairperson of the Ad Hoc International Advisory Board of Goodwill Ambassadors. Chaplain James has been, been one of my Goodwill Ambassadors for many years as has Valerie, as has many others here. So this is a family gathering. Thank you all for joining us. We love you all. And so I'm gonna leave it over to you, Captain James, I'm, not, I'm out of here. Thank you, Andrew. All right, take care, everyone. Yeah, man, good job. Oh, let me do this here before I leave. Yeah, I'm gonna- Thank you so much. Okay. We're still here at least. Thank you so much. I think uh, we have to officially call the program. Can somebody hear me? Yes, but it's breaking up, Chaplain. It breaks up a little bit. You have, a yeah. you have a challenge network, like it comes and goes. Please, can somebody hear me? I, I hear you, but it breaks right. up. Yes. I don't I can know hear my you. network. So well, like that. Wow, that's very challenging. I know how that is, that the network comes and goes. All over the world. Yeah, he keeps losing his, his network. Well, why don't we, while that's being fixed, how about if we all introduce ourselves? What do you think about that? All right, my brother. Okay, great. So let, so Chaplain James, if it's okay with you, can I have everybody introduce themselves? Please, can you hear me now? Yeah, I hear you. Okay, thank you. I think the network has been so bad. Greetings, yeah. everyone. Wow. That's not working very well. Greetings. Greetings, Mr. Carlton Brown. How are you, sir? Why don't, why don't uh, we introduce ourselves? My name is James, Master Officer of World Humanitarian Organization to Deliberate. Dr. Kare, can you hear me? Yeah, but you keep breaking up, but I hear you. Okay. I think it is a network. Yeah, it's, I'm sure so it today is. Today is the International Day, which is May 16th, and it comes up every year. 
And this is another beautiful year which we have to celebrate and uh, we have to deliberate on how we could all live together in our various communities, in our various homes, in our various countries, in our various local governments, in our various parties or wherever we are, how we can live together in peace. And uh, we have special guests in our midst today. And we also have the participants that are coming to join us today. I uh, would like to officially call the ones we have on Posa as the speaker for today. Before we open the floor to others, whom I want you. First on my list from India, and she's going to tell us to carry Dustin from United. Kingdom. And we also have Barista Head Nasera from Nigeria and Dr. Grace Mbaga from the United States of America. We have Ambassador Evans Motali from Kenya. These are the panelists, and they are the speaker for today's program to every one of us to contribute into today's uh, topic, which is International Day for Living Together in Peace. So I would like to start with Shalidas to introduce herself, if she can hear me. Then we go to others who can hear us. Then we'll continue into this program. Shalene. You have to unmute yourself, Shay. <laughs> yeah, hi. Am I audible now? Charlene? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. Please unmute so, yourself. Yeah. And tell us more. Namaste about yourself. to everybody all the way from India, Kolkata City. I'm so happy to be here to share the uh, you know skies with all the people out here. And many greetings and namaste to all. Nigeria all the way from India and uh, we have a great panelist here I'm honored to be here and many thanks to Chaplain James for giving me this opportunity to uh, be here as a guest speaker today today we are here to talk about the peace and equity all I know like peace and equity only comes you know when you know your rights when you know your fundamental rights and then you know all the etiquettes how to live uh, in family how to live in workplace how to live in schools when you're students that's how you start your journey and yes it's quite interesting like uh, I, I know Carrie Carrie is a great humanitarian and we work together and many thanks to Chaplain James that for organizing this event and uh, you know getting people from all the parts of the world and in one place that's quite interesting uh, again i'm coming like uh, if i talk about india like uh, every country they have more or less uh, domestic violence issues but we never try to know you know we don't uh, try to know that that what are the issues and how those issues are starting and what are the outcome that you can leave in peace? So coming from India, like uh, working for a human rights background, I can see there are a lot of domestic violence. And I believe that that's just happening, lack of uh, you know, human rights education. And then half of the people, they don't know how to make good choices. And half of the people, they don't know how to live in peace. And, uh, you know, the methods of the way to happiness. So if I share the journey, it's quite interesting. I started working with Youth for Human Rights, United for Human Rights since my school days. Since then, I'm you know, uh, running a mission and battle. And it has been seven years now that I'm working and I'm the brand ambassador for Youth for Human Rights, uh, Washington DC of India. I play different, different roles in different, different parts. If anybody will ask me that what are the issues, I can see that uh, women, they don't know their rights. 
youth uh, very in less very you know in uh, very less uh, places in schools and colleges there are youth advocacy programs you uh, they are, they are not in, involved into youth advocacy and then there are a lot of issues like women are going through a lot of issues if you say in india there are dowry uh, that uh, the dowry prohibition act then domestic violence act but only i believe the correct tool to uplift yourself to live in peace to know the universal declaration of the rights the 30 rights which got created by united nation in the year of 1948 when you know your rights you it can work as a weapon you know what is normal and what is not and this uh, empowering whether it's a woman or men it's just not a one day game it's a process and for that process through you know through childhood through basics in school and colleges you should know your universal declaration of fundamental rights the 30 rights which uh, you know got created from un and here is the booklets what are human rights so that's what we are working so uh, rest of, uh, i'm honored to be here again and now we have lots of panelists i would love to hear from them so thank you so much i would like to end my speech here over to your chaplain oh thank you so much for that please can we appreciate her for that she had just told us about how we can achieve this peace living together it is when we respect other people's right and we do things rightly. If you respect other people's rights, you don't infringe over their rights, or violate any of their rights. And if so, it's been done to you as well. Believe what she has said that there's going to be. A great piece in our video one from Charlene. That's from number. Thank you. We appreciate it. Then I'll quickly want to call Dr. Kare Gossip to quickly introduce himself. Tell us what you do, your organizations, and uh, tell us what we have for us today in today's uh, topic International Day for Living Together in Peace. Can we hear Thank you, you, Dr. Carter? Thank you, Chaplain James. Does everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Thank you for having me speak today, Chaplain. And thank you for your organization and what you're doing to help mankind, to help Africa. Um, thank you, everybody who's come here today. I'm sure that you're all involved with helping people, with, with making a better world, with human rights. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Shailene Das, for what you're doing in Calcutta and around India. You are a great example to the community. I know what you're doing. I see all the time what you're doing, and what you're doing is so incredible, and you are an example, and people should know more about your results that you're getting. Um, you've opened a lot of people's eyes to the brutality and the, the, the problem with human rights in India. You've opened people's eyes. And when people can see what's going on and they have tools to do something about it, that is important. It's one thing to say what's wrong. It's another thing to have tools and a way to solve the problems on planet Earth. So I really commend you, Shailene, for all of your incredible work. You are very professional and you are always communicating and always trying to help and you deserve as much support that as you can get because you have a big um, challenge in India. I want us to also commend and thank uh, Chief Chaplain Ambassador Dr. Peter Smith who is an incredible humanitarian living in Puerto Rico from New York. And he spent his life defending, helping people, helping people in need, children, adults, being a police officer, being training thousands of chaplains so they can go out in the world, working with Chaplain James, who's himself trained over 5,000 chaplains. I really wanna, we really need to commend and thank the great humanitarian that chief, the chief is, Chief 
Chief Peter Smith. So I really want to thank you, sir, for everything that you're doing, giving your time, sacrificing, volunteering. So what a great humanitarian this man is. Uh, and for the others of you here that I know and don't know, I just want to say thank you for what you're doing, for helping our planet. First, uh, my name is Kerry Goulston. I'm a humanitarian and educator for 44 years. I run an international organization that trains and helps every level of society. We've, we have helped over 3 million children since the last seven years in 25 countries. We develop educational projects, working with and partnering with like-minded organizations. We're working with many governments, ministries of education, we're working with many human rights, drug education, and positive organizations like boys clubs and girls clubs, as an example. Uh, we're working very much in Guinea, Nigeria. Last year, we trained 100,000 students. In Ghana last year, we've trained over 50,000 students and provided books. Every person that we provided a book had never owned a book before meaning every person we reached, we provided them with the first book they've ever owned. And there are 75% of the world lives in poverty conditions. So education is probably the most important part of our job is providing educational tools, resources, books, videos, free online training, for people of goodwill, leaders, educators, doctors, ministers, pastors, government. We're working with the Nigerian government. We're working with the, Ga the Ghana government. We're working with the Kenya government. But we really try to partner with as many organizations and humanitarians and educators that we can to help them. We We've done hundreds of webinars since the pandemic started. So the webinars is a good way to bring us together. It's a good way to share resources, ideas, successes. And it's a great way to develop new friendships. Because I'll tell you one thing we could do more of, come together. I think that's one thing we need more than ever is come together, unite, work together, and help each other, by providing support, by providing tools, knowledge, books, videos, training. And that's our mission. Our mission is to support you and to work together to help the children, the parents, the teachers, and the peoples of planet Earth. So, uh, our help is yours. Uh, we're ready. To, we stand ready to help any organization that is for the people. We have drug education, wonderful materials to help people to not take drugs and understand why. The human rights materials are incredible. They're incredible. Shaylee can tell you. The human rights materials we have available to us, videos, documentary, booklets, free. You can order online, educator kit for the teachers, posters. The videos are incredible. We have a common sense program called How to Make Good Choices. That's a free ebook you can send to yourself and or others, your children, your parents, teachers. We've trained 2 million children on this common sense program. Because honestly, the world is out of control. And it starts with ourselves helping educate our young people in the schools, at home, the parents. Many people don't know what to do about their kids on drugs, their kids bullying, their kids hurting others, their kids involved in things they should not be involved with. Even today, let me just say one, one coming to the end of my talk. Even today, I was sent, we're working in Germany on a project and a good friend of mine who's printing our Good Choices books in German over there sent me a book the government has distributed to 
five-year-olds, <laughs> children, and preschoolers. And the book is totally sex-driven, including promoting homosexuality, promoting five-year-old kids, promoting interracial sex and things like that. It's a picture book. The German government's putting that out for five-year-old kids. What is happening? What is happening? When they start promoting drugs and making it legal and okay, you know this planet is on the downward decline. It is really up to humanitarians to support the people, to educate the people, to train the people. Starting at an early age, some parents don't know what to do with their children. They don't know how to educate. It's okay. We can help them too. But our help is free. Our hands are open. And we have the best knowledge and resources that you could ask for. So help is here. Thank you for having me speak. Chaplain James, thank you for working together. Um, I wish all of you tremendous success. And let me leave you with one last Thanks. thing. I'm going to leave you with one last thing that will help you. As an educator for 44 years, yes, this is the last thing, Chief. It's the last thing. I promise you, <laughs> you can have lunch now. Here it is. As an educator for 44 years, and I'm also an artist, and I'm also a parent, we as a human race and as leaders can get attacked. We can get negative people in our lives. We do because our arms are open, our front door is open and all kinds of people can walk through the front door. Remember, when you get the crazy ones, the ones that say help is not possible, when you get the crazy ones in your life, that say what you're doing is wrong, that putting you down for helping people, keep your back door open and let them walk straight on through to the back door. The moral of the story is ignore the negative, ignore the negative people, they're not your friend. If they're trying to stop you from helping people, they're not your friend. And I just ignore those people that criticize, that try to make you small, that try to make less of what you're doing. I ignore those people. I ignore them. I don't bring them into my life and I don't bring them into my house. If you're helping people and somebody's putting you down, that's, you don't need those, that kind of person in your life or at least keep them away from you so they're not upsetting you too much. Because the worst thing that can happen to you as a leader and an educator is to let these people make you not want to help anymore. You not wanting to help anymore would be the worst thing that could happen. Okay, thank you so much for listening to me. I wish you all great success. Arlene, when, the, when you can, please mute your microphone. Mute your microphone, Charlene. Thank you. Please can you all hear? Yes, go ahead, James. You just said, please, can we all hear you? Can somebody hear me? All yes, right. James. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you so much for that. It is clear that your education, moral education, in schools with people, with children, can really bring about peace in our homes and our communities to achieve their goals, their aims. Helping them in their various uh, areas of needs can also help. And also moving on with positive minds, you know, ignoring the uh, objectivity or negativities. We have to be optimistic with uh, friends and relationships that we know out there. And it's a very good one for everyone, for you to make peace and to live in peace. You have to live with positive minds. So thank you so much, Dr. Kari. I think 
that is well understood and grabbed from you. And I would like to quickly call on Barrister Henne, uh, Sarah from Nigeria, to tell us more about herself, her organization, what she does, and what she has to say about this topic for today, living together in peace. So thank you so much. Over to you, Barrister Henne, Sarah from Nigeria. Good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Hello? Surely we can hear you. Thank you. Go ahead, please. My name yes, is... Yes, we can hear you. Go okay. ahead, please. Thank you, um, Ambassador James, for having this platform for us to discuss uh, the very important uh, day, International Day of Living Together, in peace. My name is Enne Sarah Nobe. I am a lawyer and the Chief Executive Director International Center for Human Rights, Nonviolence and Safety Awareness. We have our headquarters in Lagos, Nigeria. I'm the principal partner, Enne Sarah Nobe and co-legal practitioner and solicitors. It's a law firm that promotes human rights. Um, what do we do at International Center for Human Rights, Nonviolence and Safety Awareness? Three areas. One, human rights promotion and defense, nonviolence education and advocacy, and awareness creation. Uh, I want to thank the World Human Rights Organization for Peace and Equity for organizing this program for critical stakeholders on peace and peaceful living to come together to have a discourse on this very important day. International Day for Living Together in Peace means so much to me and my organization. As a lawyer, I'm confronted with legal worlds. 80% of the cases I handle has to do with family law. The world doesn't have peace today because the home, the family doesn't have peace. People are no longer peaceful with themselves. That's why they have to abuse themselves with drugs and so many other things because they are not even at peace with themselves. There's high rate of divorce in this part of the world because people can no longer live with themselves in peace. People that have vowed to live together in peace and harmony, they'll come to court and tell you, we can, I can no longer tolerate this person. We are no longer peaceful at home. There is so much domestic violence and that leading to communal, community violence and we're having violence in the country and violence in the world. Why? Because peace, people have lost peace in their hearts. They, could, they can no longer live with themselves in peace. Just, just two people living with themselves in peace today is quite difficult to find. Why? Because selfishness has become order of the day. It's about me, myself, and I. Today is a day where we have to promote tolerance and reconciliation. Because when two people live with themselves, I can tell you they need to tolerate each other. What does it mean to tolerate? To tolerate means to your willingness or ability to endure different opinion, different attributes that are not yours that you may not on your own want to take, but because you want to accommodate the other person, you want to create a space to understand with that person at the person's point of view and find a way of striking the balance between your view and that person's view. So I don't want to go to the history of today. The National International Day for living together in peace for me is a day that we, we have to look inward. Human, there's no way you can live together in peace with someone without promoting that promoting human rights. You must have respect for human rights. Human rights, respect for human rights is a foundation for living in peace with anybody. If you don't respect other people's rights, their right to life, 
the right to dignity of human person, the right to liberty, the right to peaceful assembly, it will lead to chaos, it will lead to violence, it will lead to um, violence and so many other things that disrupt peace. So as stakeholders, we must uh, um, tell ourselves there's need for us to be peaceful with ourselves, to take things easy with ourselves. If you are living a competitive life, you are living in a life that you feel, oh, I've not gotten everything I want, so I will not be peaceful. I need to take drugs to make me forget about my pain. In no time, we begin to sell those drugs to other people, other children. By the end of the day, it becomes self-destructive and begin to destroy the community. What are the things we ought to do as uh, peace as advocates? One, we must engage our families, our communities. We must live a lifestyle of peace. You cannot give what you don't have. So if you don't have peace, you cannot give peace. So when you have peace in your heart, you can give peace to others. I've seen parents who have deliberately and constantly advocate and um, so seed of discord amongst their children and in terms of telling them, oh, don't trust this tribe, don't marry this person because he's not from your place, he's not your race. So, oh, they're like this, they're like that. In my own point of view, I don't think anybody is born a racist or a tribalist. These things are intentionally being told by people that have the opportunity to be in our lives at one point or the other, and they use their privileged positions as a guardian to sell certain ideas to us and make us not live in peace with other people. So as parents, are you teaching your children to be peaceful? Are you teaching them to be a bully or not to be a bully? We have to look inward. Then as governments, in Nigeria, we don't have our election. Division and divisive um, messages were sent across. These people that were once living with themselves in peace no longer live with themselves in peace now. Why? Because of the political differences and using ethnicity and tribalism and religion as a, as a, as a tool for political campaign. We are yet to heal fully from that. So as peace advocates, we must go back to our communities and try to repair what politicians have left us with, a, dis a disconnected and a disunited community. We must go back to them and tell them, in spite of what happened, we must live together in peace. No development can happen without us being peaceful. So I want to speak to stakeholders, um, politicians and whoever has the opportunity of leading people, please don't use this unity. Don't use religion and things that divide people as a tool for your political campaign. You may win the election, but you need people living together in peace. You need your, your people to be peaceful before you can lead them. So I want to call on every stakeholder here Use your platform to promote peace. Live in peace in your community and be an advocate for peace. Finally, if you look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the preamble, one of the preambles talked about people living together in peace. You can also look at the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. The preamble said also there also said we the people of nine uh, we the people of the federal republic of nigeria have solemnly agreed to live together in peace and harmony so every other thing in the constitution depends on what that preamble portrays what the preamble says so if you're talking about right to life right to other things it must be on the platform of people agreeing to live together in in peace Living together in peace is a choice, and it's a choice of the wise. So we have to make that choice every day that in spite of our differences, in spite of our um, gender or whatever, we must resolve to live together in peace. Have a wonderful international day for living together in peace. Let me pray. Thank you. Thank you so much. You have really shown to the world that you are Nigerian. 
Barrister Ellen. <laughs> Thank you so much. It has been a wonderful one from you. And uh, we quite appreciate it. James, we're no so longer coming, hearing you. And if I have said that even if you are peaceful yourself, you'll be able to render peace to other people. You said that's why some do engage in uh, dealing with drugs and things like that because they are not. at peace with themselves. Conflict, intra-conflict in their marriages, in their home, it being in itself, it doesn't trust himself, it doesn't trust herself, and things like that. So the primary duty is to ensure we are at peace with ourselves, then with your partner, with your children, and from there you can go to the expanse of the world. And more so, rights to life, rights to peaceful access to this rights to that. If we keep to all this, there will be peace in our various community homes. There will be peace in our countries. And you also said that it is very achieving how to be peaceful because we have some parents that will be telling their children not to be uh, going marriage with some certain group of people because they are uh, of another ethnic group, which is wrong, which is bringing the problem to our world today. So people, peace education, their relatives, in their families, in their homes. So thank you so much. Barisa Enne for coming on board and enlightening us more on this and how to live together in peace. So thank you. I would like to quickly go to Dr. Grace Mbaga. We would like to hear from you. You say you are multiple award winners. <laughs> That's why we call you here. We want to know why you receive all those awards. And uh, whatever you have to say today, if it doesn't deserve any award, we are going to write and make sure the award is very gift back from you. So that is why you got this election. Even your words and whatsoever you say to show that truly you are multiple award winners. So over <laughs> to you, Dr. Grace Mbaga. James, <laughs> before uh, Dr. Bruce speaks, can I just say <clears throat> that I would very much like to speak on this okay. topic. I'd very much like to speak on this topic. Yes, the grandma will call you. You are surely coming in after Mbaga, please. Granny, you are coming in after Mbaga. We're going to call you. So thank you. Yes, uh, good, good morning, everyone. Again, my sincere apologies. I did plan on coming on camera, uh, like uh, young people say, with your face beat, makeup and all that. But allergies are the best of me. No allergies can fix this. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm originally from Cameroon and I've been living in the United States uh, for the past uh, 20 years. And uh, I, uh, I see myself as a community activist, human rights uh, advocate, and I'm a humanitarian. So uh, in the community here in, uh, in the, the U.S., I, wore, I wear multiple hats. Uh, I also uh, teach as a, an adjunct professor, and actually I teach conflict resolution uh, to uh, our uh, young adults. So as a community leader, I have uh, 16 years of uh, experience working uh, with uh, individuals from uh, different uh, socioeconomical backgrounds. Uh, I'm fluent in uh, eight languages, so yeah, my apologies, I have uh, an accent in all eight of them. So it, I uh, here in the US because we live in an immigrant, uh, I call it an immigrant country. Uh, most people here are immigrants anyway, even though sometimes some people tend to forget it, except for the 
Indian Americans, as they are called, or Native Americans. So um, every now and then, I will be. I work with organizations here from the Hispanic uh, uh, community. Uh, I served uh, for a couple of years as an intern with a Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. Uh, she's a Democrat and uh, one of the top voices here on uh, Capitol Hill to bring about change. And also she's a big champion of uh, Africa. Uh, some of the laws that were passed, for example, like the Agua, uh, Agua law that allows us Africans to uh, import, uh, I mean like export some of our goods and sell them here uh, in America. She was a champion for pushing uh, forward that uh, legislation. I've worked on a couple of uh, life-changing immigration key issues as a community activist. One of them is uh, mainly what is called, commonly known as the green card lottery. Uh, it's the diversity visa that gives the opportunity to 55, uh, I think it's 55,000 uh, winners, the opportunity to come to America legally with a green card. And uh, back in 2013, that program, uh, there was a law that was passed in Congress to actually get rid of it. So myself, because I'm a former winner, uh, myself and a couple of uh, just a handful of people, we lobbied Congress and we were able to keep uh, the green card lottery. And this issue was um, like uh, crucial to me because like I said, I'm a, I'm a past winner, but then through research, I found out that through the, the diversity program, the green card lottery, Africa as a continent has 20,000 of those visas that are issued every year. So there, there was no way I would just hardly sit and let us lose that opportunity. Uh, the one other, if I call, I don't know if I can call it an accomplishment. We also, uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine and it's good like today we are trying to teach people how to live in peace, live peacefully within our communities, within our borders, avoid discrimination. So. When uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, I think that was like almost a year or two ago, some of our African brothers got stranded at the border. They were facing vicious racial discrimination in the middle of the winter. And of course, us activists, we took on to social media, but we were not getting the results that we wanted. So I uh, participated in a couple of protests in front of the White House. I was the only black person there, the only African. I didn't really care. I attended that protest with a Black Lives Matter t-shirt because I'm also part of the Black Lives Matter, uh, Matter movement, just to remind humanity that even in the midst of war, Black lives still matter. We, we cannot have a refugee is a refugee. When there's a situation where there's no peace and people decide to leave to save their lives, you cannot come and handpick who deserves to cross the border and who doesn't. So uh, we had that... Uh, uh, protest in front of the White House. Then we had a second one. It was also a peaceful protest. No police was called, nobody got arrested. We had a second protest with uh, key uh, leaders in Congress and Senate. Uh, they, we have uh, senators and um, uh, congressmen and women who attended this protest. And what I did is I showed up again with a Black Lives Matter t-shirt. As usual, I was the only black person there. I uh, brought the videos that were being shared online gave them to the staff and uh, within 24 hours, the, the US uh, Congress issued a public statement that was followed the next day by the African Union to condemn the racial discrimination uh, that we were facing at the border. So these are just some of the things that I get myself involved in. Like James is the one who follows me on, uh, on social media. Sometimes people ask me, where do you get time to sleep? I'm like, when you're a humanitarian, it's a calling. You see, you, you, it's a calling that chose you. You don't get to choose it. And you have to make the necessary sacrifices just to make sure that all human beings are treated with respect, with, uh, with equity and respect again. And all human beings deserve to live in peaceful environments, whether it be at work, whether it be on the job, or, or even if you go to a party, if you decide to protest, we have seen instances in countries like where I'm from in Cameroon, where people want to protest against the government and it's supposed to be a peaceful protest, but then uh, a police shows up with hoses and people get arrested. 
So we do, we do have to respect like some other parties said before that human rights are important. And me, I'm a big advocate on uh, women and girls uh, education, women and girls empowerment. I, uh, in 2017, I started a, scholar, uh, a uh, internship program here for first generation of African immigrant girls. Every year we go to the United Nations Global Engagement Summit just to expose them uh, to an event of that magnitude and they get to listen to leaders of the world who come and speak at the uh, United Nations headquarters. We do campus tours, we do a lot of work, you know, community activism, we do a lot of community volunteering. Um, not only here in the US, we are trying to extend even in, uh, in Africa. So, and again, teaching our children, like uh, uh, somebody has said before me, teaching our children about peace is very important. You cannot be an agent of peace if, like, if you yourself, you don't bring peace and you don't promote it. I cannot come here on a glorious day like this one and talk to you about peace and then my whole house is in chaos. And I'm the one who's through gossip, through fights on social media. And that's gonna be my last point. I'm also an advocate against cyberbullying. A lot of us, we see what's happening into our African platforms on social media, where people literally, we are lynching each other through our words. We are saying all kinds of negativity, spreading negativity, just destroying each other on social media at a point where some of us are asking if we were even ready for that platform. We can all agree to debate on social media platforms peacefully, respectfully, without going at each other's throat. So we are working on some type of legislation. Next time uh, Mark Zuckerberg is called in Congress, just so that he can put even strict, more strict, uh, 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 I don't know, like actions against people who are practicing and spreading hate speech, uh, doing cyberbullying and spreading xenophobia. Like in our, those of us who are from Africa, we know what it is that to be from a, um, a tribe that is different than uh, one of our counterparts. And we uh, Africa, in Africa, we've seen the example with Rwanda, what happened between the Tutsi and the Hutus. We are seeing that wanting to take root again through social media, where people are, are, are pushing each other just to hate and they spread either false information, vicious lies or, or, on social media platform, TikTok, especially Facebook and Twitter. That is something that we need to get it under control and we can actually use social media like some of us do to pro promote peace, to educate people about peace and even what it means to be a peace, uh, a peace uh, agent, if I can call it like that. So thank you so much for the time. Th thank you so much. You have judiciously used your time and uh, I know you are time conscious. Thank you, uh, Dr. Grace Mbaga. Uh, you have rightly educated us today. Human rights, and not just human rights, you now talk about empowerment, that our people need to be empowered. If not so, they misbehave. Like somebody that is hungry now, you can offer such a person any amount and is ready to go to any length. Of doing what he wants because he or she needs that whatever do for because uh, they know they're going to give them money use needs money so that is why it is very important to that while promoting peace you must understand that you need to empower people if they have enough they'll be at peace and uh, if they are able to have or get what they want it will help them you know to sit back and rethink about their life instead of just roaming about like Barista and I talk about uh, drug addicts and things like that. They're jobless, they have nothing to do. They are there under the bridge, you no know, smoking and things like that. So we have to think as well on how to empower them, to encourage them, at least to put them on the right footing. So thank you so much, Dr. Grace, for that wonderful time we had with you.
Uh, I want uh, Ambassador Evans Mutavi to be in readiness. I don't know if he's here. Please, if you are here with us, Mutavi, you have to indicate for us to know you are here because all the names we're seeing here, we can't find Evans Mutavi. But you if you promise, are grandmother, lying or whatsoever, please let us know. You yes. promise, grandmother. Yes, yes, I know. Thank you. Uh, Evans, if you are here, please indicate, let us know you are here. You are going to speak after the granny. And uh, this is the time to hear from the granny in the house about humanitarianism, she's there. When you talk about education, she's there. When you talk about human rights, she's there. When you talk about empowerment, she's there. When you talk about winning awards and things like that, she's there. If you talk about royalty, the granny is there. So our granny, Valerie, please, over to you. Let's hear from you. Let's hear well, from you, granny. <clears throat> thank you. Um, actually, I am Sorry. rather pessimistic about the future. Um, we are okay. at a crossroads. We are at a crossroads now. We. When uh, Sir David Attenborough was 11 years old, there were 2 million, 2 billion, 2.3 billion people in the world. Now, in his old age, there are over 8 billion people in the world. We are getting there are too many people in the world. And this could lead, not only has it led to war in, Ugan in um, Ukraine, it has led to many refugees. For the first time in human history, there are now over 100 million refugees in the world. Another 6.4 million came from Ukraine. Uh, over 100,000 people now are fleeing from Sudan. We have got war and we have got to be very careful about, that we take care of our planet because the sea levels are predicted to rise, which means there will be less land for us people, this huge number of people to live on. Countries like Tuvalu, which have only got two meters, their maximum height is two meters. Those countries will disappear. Denmark is flat as a pancake. Holland, much of Holland is already underwater. They've built up the dams, but unless they carry on building up the dams and, that, and Holland becomes an island, those countries will disappear. Many countries in the Maldives, in, in low-lying lands around the world, where are those people going to go? I live in Wales. Many countries around the world, including Wales, the largest number of population is at sea level. I'm, I live halfway up a little mountain, so I know I'm okay, but most people live at sea level. Look at the photographs of places like Rio de Janeiro, and they're all living at sea level. People tend to think that perhaps the sea won't rise, but it has risen and is rising. 8,000 years ago, I could have walked from the UK to Denmark and France. We can't do that anymore. The sea level rose and covered the land. We know that people lived. Sorry, someone. Different. Yep. That we know that people lived on, uh, on, the, on the seabed because stone tools have been found. 8,000 years ago, the land was, we had much more land and a much smaller population. Now we have 8 billion people in the world and it's growing every day. So what are we to do? We first of all need to make sure that we care for our planet because without our planet, we have nowhere else to go. There is no planet B. We can't move to another country because other countries won't want us. Already in the UK, we cannot feed our population. We have to import food. 
But if the sea level rises and, pe and people in their own country need that food, they won't want to sell it to us. It could be Armageddon. We could be looking at Armageddon. I hope I won't be here to see it, but we can take steps now. <clears throat> and it's vital that we take those steps now. Yes, all this advocating and so on is really, really good and useful stuff. But unless we care for the land on which we stand, there will not be peace. And I think that's really all I have to say. If anyone has a question, I would love to answer. Granny, there'll be more questions. Thank you for your contributions to this uh, program. We love you, Granny, because you are always there. You are always there for us. You are always there for us. Thank you so much. I love that. And uh, I still love the enthusiasm you have you know, putting together. I will tell you this. You are stronger than these ladies of 40s or 50s here. You are stronger than they are. Some of them are lazy. But granny is always there, active and Niger. So thank you so much. Because some are still disturbing me. They are unable to get in. They're unable to connect. They don't even know what to do. Meanwhile, the granny is here earlier before any one of them. So you are so active, and I love that. So don't mind all those uh, well, younger generation. Don't mind remember them. Remember, my, my birthday, I will be 82 on the 4th of July. So um, July. Have a good wow. I, a, I was wow. I was I was born wow. independent. Um, Happy so birthday. I will not I will Happy not be birthday. here. See, we have we have started your birthday already. <laughs> and uh, I would I, like I, to quickly say this. The other granny we have there, Grandpa Granny, or whatever we want to call him, Chief Chaplain from Puerto Rico, is July, uh, is June 30th. June 30th, you are July 1st. I think uh, we have two days celebration. July the 4th, American July Independence 1st. Day. That no, four. 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 Yes. Okay, four. All right. American so Independence Day. Are... But the point I was trying to make is that, yes, listen to what I'm saying, because if, unless we care for the land on which we place our feet, there won't okay. be enough land for all of the people in this world. And that very will true. cause war. Very true and very well said. So we'll move James out and you and I will stay. We will eliminate <laughs> James, Graham, your Royal no. Majesty Princess. We, we will not eliminate anybody. Ah, oh, come on. Thank I you, wanted Graham. to eliminate James. You, but okay, I'm going to keep quiet. <laughs> Thank you, Granny. Thank you. I trust you. <laughs> I trust Granny. Thank you so much, Granny, for this uh, wonderful time we, you had with us. Thank you, and we love you. We appreciate your coming. And you are always there to contribute to our success. We so much appreciate you. Uh, Granny, there's nothing to fear or to worry about. God, who has created the universe, who created heaven and earth, knows how tomorrow will be. So we don't need to panic or care over anything. Even the land we have in the world, we have not even conquered. Uh, one quarter. So we believe with God, all things are working smoothly, and we just have to keep our faith and hope in Him. So, Granny, they rest assured that God is in perfect control. I would like to say that. Sorry, I don't agree. We have got war all over the world now in Ukraine, yes. in DRC yes. Congo, in Sudan. Yes. And yes. We, we, we can't, we. Uh, God, God is with us, yes, but only if we actually work in ways that, that create peace. It's not yes. good just talking about it. You've got to take action. I got your point. And that is why I purposely invite somebody today into this uh, meeting, into this conference. 
I don't know if it's ready. Uh, Cloud Mugabe, are you here with us from Rwanda? I would like to officially introduce him before I call Chief Chaplain to talk, because uh, before I call Ambassador Brown from the Friends of Africa Union to talk, and some other people to talk on this issue in Rwanda. All what we have all said combined together, you will see reasons for us to always live in peace. You will see reasons for all of us to always abide in peace. You will see all of why it is compulsory for us to promote peace wherever we are, from our homes, from our family, within our friends and relatives. It's, I'm not going to tell you, I would like it to come from the horse's mouth. Uh, the very young man you've seen here, Cloud Mugabe, is from Rwanda, is a survivor of a genocide that took place in Rwanda in 1994. He's a survivor. So he, ha he has more to tell. When we went to Ru Rwanda, he was one of the officials we met at Genocide Memorial Center in Rwanda. He was the one taking us around, showing us the pictures of the Memorial Genocide Center in Rwanda, telling us what happened to the children, to the women, to the men. Thousands, 800 millions of people died in that genocide. And even how the Church of God betrayed the people. They ran to the church for safety. They betrayed them, sold them to the enemy. So we have more to tell. When we talk about living together in peace, there are more to that. May the gentle souls of those victims, I would like to call Cloud Mugabe, to tell us about himself. His organizations. The country and in Rwanda in 19... Mugabe, can we hear from you? Please go ahead, please. Mugabe? Lord Mugabe, go ahead, please. You're unmuted. Unmute yourself. Then we can't hear you. Maybe you will remove your mic, the happy. Okay, Claude, try one more time to unmute yourself, sir. You are muted. Unmute yourself. Claude, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Unmute. Sorry, everyone. Thank you.
No, Claude, we're not hearing you. Do, do you guys hear me? Yes, sir. We hear you. You hear me, then? Yes, sir. Go ahead. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, can uh, Mr. James remind me exactly what you want me to talk about? Because I was not hearing him well. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I hear you. I want you to tell us your name, your country, your organization, and what you can really recall that happened in 1994 in Rwanda. All right, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Uh, James, uh, our distinguished uh, 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 panelists and uh, uh, the participants. It's my pleasure to join you. Um, and I'm happy uh, to celebrate this uh, day of uh, international uh, day of living. So I'm very humble to, to join the calls. Um, my name is Claude Mugabe. Um, I work at uh, Kigali Genocide Memorial uh, uh, with uh, Aegis Trust, which is um, um, a UK based um, you know, uh, organization which aim to, to prevent uh, a genocide through uh, promoting peace uh, and the values, but also through education. Uh, I work at a, a place which is a place of remembrance and a place for learning for the future. So our place is made up by, you know, a final resting place, of more than 259,000 victims of genocide killed only in Ikigari. And also our place has a, a genocide museum uh, that was great for a purpose of education. And uh, we received many people, uh, locals, internationals, uh, different categories of the people, uh, leaders worldwide, head of states, head of governments have been coming to visit this center. And of course, they all learn, uh, learn from the experience of genocide uh, through museum exhibition. And uh, it's look more, more, more education. It's a piece, one of the piece museum that we have around the world. Um, apart from working uh, at this place, uh, I'm also connected with this uh, genocide you talk about, genocide again, Tutsis, 94. I was not, uh, uh, I was not uh, old enough in 1994. I was uh, a child of eight years, but I could remember everything. Um, uh, walking to the memorial, I started working the memorial since 2013, uh, facilitating people to learn and understand this uh, uh, sensitive topic of genocide. Um, I've been also able to create uh, uh, an initiative also in my native place, my, in my village. Uh, I've been able to forgive one of the killers of my family. I met with uh, another colleague, a fellow survivor, who also survived genocide, but also been able to forgive the killers of his family. And then we, we put together ideas, uh, what we can do uh, in our community through that experience we had. We tell the perpetrators of uh, our families during genocide to encourage other perpetrators who confessed their law played in genocide. And uh, we went together in our villages, and then we start building uh, a cohesive, I mean, a unified and a harmonious society made by uh, our fellow survivors who have been able to, to forgive because uh, forgiveness is, an, uh, is another human values, uh, another strength from a human because it's not easy sometimes. When you have visitors, they don't understand how come this can be possible uh, to forgive. But one of the people had a, a particular uh, 
society that oblige uh, everyone to live together, even if you had the issues in the past. Uh, forgiveness traditionally uh, used to be existing. If you have uh, got any problem with others, so you need to sit together and find a solution peacefully. So it's not something that comes from from abroad. So we need to have it. So we have been able to encourage our fellow survivors and those who commit genocide, uh, accept that crime and uh, decide to ask forgiveness forgiven. Uh, today, we are a community called uh, Peace Education Initiative, Rwanda, based in our village. We have uh, nowadays uh, over 200 uh, community, uh, composed by the families, the chief of families, and the community is made up by both sides. Uh, we had uh, 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 200 uh, community survivors uh, and also uh, 28 perpetrators of genocide, those particular groups who accept what they did. Uh, and um, uh, we are now facilitating uh, our community, huge community, to uh, to live again each other uh, as it was, and um, um, I would like to inform you that uh, most of the community uh, we had, uh, some of the, those who survived, they survived from the church. You see, uh, the church uh, uh, was a Roman Catholic church, but uh, the mass killings happened there during genocide. But also those who accept what they what they committed from the church, you see, they have been able to to face justice and sentence years, fifteen years, twenty years, twenty five. Uh, uh, we are also using them to to teach young people uh, what they did and how there was they were manipulated during before genocide by the leaders. This is outside of the church. Uh, some of the photos taken by. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, some uh, freelancer journalists, you know, and they've been able to share these uh, uh, the images of that church. So uh, we, uh, this community is very, very related to this topic of living, I mean, international way of living, because we have seen that uh, living together, if you could live together, if the government before genocide could encourage people uh, living together instead of dividing them, would not have this uh, genocide. Uh, most of the perpetrators who kill people, if ask them why they did this, they say that we were told that if you kill these people, we will become rich, we, we, we will loot their properties, we will take their cows, we will take their home, beautiful homes. So we thought that uh, if you kill them, we'll be have free space and take their properties. So the lack of critical thinking, the lack of uh, values, the lack of living together uh, ended our community having genocide. Now, this is a community we have, a peaceful community we have. If uh, next time James has time, if you come in Rwanda, I will be, make sure that uh, you visit our community and meet with some, uh, 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 some uh, beneficiaries and member of that community. So now let me use like three minutes to talk about uh, um, the place I work with always. One and people live together. They live together before colonialism. Uh, people are living in harmony, you know, no hate. Uh, people of Rwanda had one language. Even, even nowadays, there is one language in Rwanda. The same culture, the same values. But uh, in, in the colonial period, the policies of colonialism divide our community. The belligerents you divide, divide, divide and rule as a policy. And that policy is, if you can see the way they implemented that policy, uh, the society, which was very strong, was completely destroyed. Tutsi and Hutu and Twa, I don't know if some of you have heard about those names. Naturally, those names existed in our community, but, it, it, but it, they have never caused any problems. If you have many cows, you are known as Tutsi, because cow in our society is a sign or a symbol of worth, you know, traditionally. And it was a minority group. The middle one made by majority were farmers, known as Hutus. The third one called the Tua, the Tutsi, the Twa, were just 
a small group identify themselves as a native of this land and the majority were hunters. Others lived with, um, uh, there were poetry, there were poetry made, made you know, but it, the structure was, you know, dynamic. People could change and move classes. It had never caused any problems. But during the colonial period, those classes were shifted and called ethnic groups. They introduced them in our in our identity cards. And you can imagine how this, I mean, how it impacts our community neg in negative way. People were separated. After colonization, the leadership of Rwandans have been informed that the Tutsis are dangerous people. The Tutsis were coming from, you know, they immigrate from out of Africa, nomad people from north of Africa, you know, immigrating with their cattle, you know, they're not natives. You should avoid them, you should prevent preventing them. They are not native of this land. And it was a lie. It was very, very uh, strategic to divide our community. After independence from 1960s, the leadership of Rwanda continued to the same system of dividing our community, creating also other policies like regionalism, uh, discrimination policies, you know, the humanizing group, uh, group of the people uh, instead of one or the two things. Until 1990s were the, the Hutu side understood, I mean, generations by generation, that uh, the, the Tutsis are, are not native of this land. They are foreigners. We need to, to you know, to pull out uh, those people out of, of, out, of uh, uh, out of, I mean, out of the country. A lot of engagement happened from uh, leadership, honestly, between 1990s to 1994. A lot of rehearsals of genocide, the creation of uh, militias group training them to kill. The media were used to propagand genocide. The hate speech from top leaders, which uh, mobilized and sensibilized uh, uh, hates to one group. Until in 1994, month of April, uh, the president of Rwanda at time uh, called General Habyarimana Juvenal, who died from plane crash. It seems like the death of the president was well organized. And uh, uh, after the president died, all the parties, militians, neighbors, people, uh, government forces, police, all security organs, they all regrouped in, in many groups of killers and then start killing people. Who are victims? The victims were people called Tutsis. I was among of the groups. You know, it's another story. Um, honestly, something, you know, three months, equivalent 100 days were enough to massacre more than 1 million people around the country. You know, it's very huge, 100 days. The, the, the House of God, uh, churches, particularly Catholic churches, you know, becoming a killing site. You know, people were frightened throating people over there, you know, like animals. Uh, I was in a church, you know, you know, it's another story behind, you know, if you try to talk what happened to you. Uh, people were killed in the public schools, on the streets, everywhere could be a killing site. Dead bodies were thrown in the wrecks, rivers, you know, even those dead bodies, we didn't find them to bury them. Sometimes when it comes to Comrade genocide, we go there to depose flowers. So after genocide and genocide was stopped, the new government of Rwanda uh, composed one of the uh, uh, one and protesting fronts, the politicians who end genocide. Uh, so they create a government of unity and reconciliation, and we start uh, building uh, uh, our lives again. You know, the process of rebuilding the country started again from 1994 uh, up to now. A lot of initiative were cut out, uh, traditional justice, uh, international reactions, international community reactions. And of course, um, this has been helping uh, our community to come up together, but also local uh, initiative like a, ch a court called the Gachacha. It's another topic as well, how we handle our problems in terms of justice from the local, uh, local court called the Gachacha, where the judges were just coming from those communities and uh, they use just uh, 
no degrees about law, uh, no expertise. They just use uh, human values to, uh, to judge people. They were just integrity people, transparent one, honesty, and uh, they facilitate uh, our community to come up again. And those are the normal, I mean, the huge number of cases were ordinary ones, and uh, the high co uh, the cases were transferred into the high courts. Uh, I survived genocide, as I told you. And um, uh, I, I struggle a lot with my mom, but I, like, I lost my father and my young sister the way killed you know, by machete. And, uh, and, and um, I, lost, I lost also many aunts and uncles, uh, cousins. You know, if I counted may, uh, the number of the people I lost in my large family, it's over 68 people. Surviving genocide means a lot to me. It's a reason that uh, I accept to share my story uh, but um, I know being an eyewitness is be also it will be helping others to learn from our experiences. Working at the memorial over ten years also empowered me empowered me to be a good uh, uh, educator in terms of peace. Apart from studying from university such a uh, subject, uh, I'm also connected with this uh, history of genocide as a survivor. This is why I was very very. Uh, motivated to go in my community and also create a peaceful community where people could live together again. Probably we don't have much time. I don't know if James have that uh, short video, but uh, if you see that we don't have much time, we can also, you can even share it to your colleagues after. Uh, but uh, uh, I can be an eyewitness of how not living to, together in our country before 1994 lead or facilitate genocide to be possible. It starts from a little thing. If you don't accept that you are different, the difference between you, we should understand that we are different. Nigerians can't behave like Rwandans. The Rwandans can also behave like Ugandans and others. So we, we, it, those small differences that uh, differentiate us it, it, can't, it doesn't be a problem that could create that chaos. Behind the difference between us, we are human beings. We know that um, conflicts are naturally existing. We, we were born, uh, I was born hearing uh, conflict around the world. Uh, we learned from the First World War, the Second World War, before also there are some uh, conflict, religious conflict that you know kill many people around the world. But uh, I've seen that uh, conflicts are naturally existing. But others are constructed by human beings. The architects of genocide in Rwanda were runners. They were human beings. They were leaders. They were intellectuals. And then the question comes to me, I mean, the question comes to me, uh, if you know that conflicts are naturally existing, others are constructed, yes, we'll be having problems, we'll be having conflicts as human beings, even with, with animals have conflicts. And I was wondering, the question comes always to me every day, how, how as human beings, how can we be uh, good managers of conflicts. That's the only problem seeing that. If we can be good managers of conflicts, we know where the com conflicts come from. We know how can deal a conflict peacefully without uh, creating escalation of violence, which can lead to such atrocities. Uh, I think uh, the message could reach to everyone, particularly uh, from the leaders, the decision makers and in Rwanda, if the government could not decide to kill its own people, if the government could not involve in the planning and organizing up to execution of genocide, honestly, today we no, no longer talk about genocide. We could talk recently, the small events 
I mean, the conflict that led to a small conflict, but it was uh, managed and uh, handled by the people of Guam. We no longer talk about genocide. Mugabe. Now, before I end, my my my. Mugabe. Yes, sir. Mugabe, please just give us a minute. I want to quickly play, play this uh, interview when we were there in Rwanda. And after that, we want to tell us, we want you to tell us the present situation in Rwanda now, after All this right, short okay. video. No problem, you can go ahead. Thank you for your patience. Uh, that is Kigali, Rwanda Memorial Center. And uh, that was uh, Mugabe himself uh, entertaining the tourists coming around to know what happened in the Rwanda. And he was the one educating them about this piece and also telling them what actually happened with different pictures and symbols in uh, Rwanda Memorial, uh, Genocide Memorial Center. I was there present uh, myself, I, I was present there that very day, and that was where I met Mugabe. So, and it's a great pleasure having him on board today too. Please, we just want you to summarize everything now and tell us the present situation in Rwanda now. And what do you think the way forward? You have witnessed it. You saw what happened? 
And you also witness some other things that happened after that. So just summarize and tell us the present situation and what is the way forward for us to live together in peace in our various communities and our various nations. And you also said something now, and I want you to quote that or make mention it now. You said it that day that Rwanda is no more using anything by ethnic group in your national ID card. All you have now, it is nationality. It is very important. When we promote ethnic groups, ethnicity, rather than nationality, that's what we have. But if you promote nationality, if you are Nigerian, see yourself as Nigerians, no Igbo, no Hausa, or you, no Yoruba. If you are Rwanda, see yourself as Rwanda, nothing like Utu, nothing like Kuti. So let tell us more about all those things and the way forward and the solution to those problems now. So thank you so much. All right. <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, James. Uh, yes, um, the recovering process uh, after genocide um, was a challenge, a challenge the government of Rwanda after genocide, the people of Rwanda themselves as well. Uh, there was a mis mistrust between us. Uh, when I was school, primary school, secondary school, you know, sometimes when you go to play either football be, uh, uh, game, soccer, sometimes if you meet some of the young from the families that you think that they commit genocide, you always, you know, fear them. And the children didn't do anything apart from the, their parents. So now, uh, after genocide, the government, as you mentioned, immediately have seen that uh, we are all Rwandans. We have one language. We have one culture. We have the same identity. We share a common identity. So this is why immediately those ID cards from the colonial period, they were quickly renovated and uh, removing uh, ethnicity was uh, a priority. And um, the ethnicity in our ID card was replaced by nationality. We are we all by nationality. We are all one people. It had been helping a lot because even those who tried to use genocide ideology through ethnicity, it was no easy. It was no easy to, nowadays to identify who's a Tutsi, who's a Hutu. So it's something that were uh, created. It's something that were uh, officialized and until it's created a problem. Before intermarriage was not allowed, you know, intermarriage, you know, if you marry a Tutsi wife, sometimes were considered as a betrayer person. So, so living together in Rwanda before genocide, you know, it was, I mean, you can't see that sign of living together. Intermarriage is also another sign of, you know, people happy who are sharing, who are living together. Um, but uh, in that time, it was forbidden. So nowadays, the things are, you know, they were stored, you know, things are moving forward. It takes time, of course, but uh, nowadays, uh, that uh, social status destroyed by the history, it's now under, uh, you know, it, 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 it was built progressively. Intermarriage nowadays existed, but before it was not. Uh, I would mention that something that, um, the, the, the split of sharing. Uh, I use an example of the community we have. We have, we have one day we saw, we have a visitor from US and they contribute something to our community. And immediately we decided to buy domestic animals, goats. It was not many, it was like 50 goats. And we decided to give randomly families and we gave them tasks. If the gods produce more gods, please make sure you share to a neighbor. That was uh, like a test you want to see if our communities are really, uh, you know, motivated to live together. So what happened is that it happened. Those people who got 50 uh, gods, they have been able to share with others. And others also, they elevated, elevated uh, um, uh, gods and the gods produce. And I would like to inform that nowadays the whole village, the whole village have have gods, have domestic gods, starting from from fifty people. Now the power of sharing as well always also can also facilitate uh, living together. 
Another thing that the government of Rwanda made, uh, Gachacha courts, one of the traditional courts were used, as I mentioned about it before, uh, it helps a lot people to come up together. The, the, the courts happen at the villages level. Uh, the people were called from prisons and they go back to the villages. And um, the trial happened within people, within, within the village. So for the first time, the truth happened. For the first time, people can face publicly and apologize, ask forgiveness. And for the first time, the survivors who had the power of resisting because forgiveness is a power. It's, I can call it a, an abstract power that comes from, I don't know where it's come from. There is no, nobody who can push you to forgive. There is no government uh, 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 orders, you know, go and forgive. No, forgiveness is more individual. Uh, and I would like to quote, to quote something. Gachacha came as a, a solution because for the first time that court helped people to, to forgive because people met with those who perpetrated them. I mean, who killed people. Uh, if you can have a chance to see someone who approach and tell you what happened, why they kill people. And of course, I would like to inform that there are people who missed their blouse one, the body of the blouse ones. But through that, the Gachacha court, those who killed, when they confess, they have been able to identify, I mean, to tell families, victims, where their loved ones were killed. And of course, some of the families who have missed already completely their loved ones, the body of the loved ones, they have been able to exhume the bodies and they bury them in the dignity. So I'm trying to mention some uh, uh, key importance of uh, these uh, courts, uh, community courts. Um, I would like to inform that the, the process of reconciliation began from that initiative. So there are many homegrown solutions that were initiated by the government. And those homegrown solutions had much success, including a church. Um, I could also share with you another policies coming from the government for Rwanda initiated I, by I, the- I think, the you, I think you have really tried. You have really tried. Uh, that's a wonderful one from you. I, so and I want to you. just just give me a second, a second. I want to mention something. There is a program called uh, in Kenya Rwanda, Giringa. Giringa it means uh, uh, one cow, one cow per family. So the families are got also cows, and they were told to share cows. So I would like to inform you that nowadays uh, the community, many of them have cows, but it's starting from just few number of the cows. So sharing also. I repeat it again, I commit, I mean, I always repeat again, if the people are able to share whatever they have, little thing they have, so it's another sign of living together again. So we have a lot of initiative that were cut out, uh, but today we live together, intermarriage existed. We always attend ceremonies together. Uh, we, 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 we worship together in the church, we, you know, but before it was not the case. So. The time is jealous, very limited, but uh, I have a lot of things to share with you. But uh, Rwanda has an example of how living together can be possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, may the gentle soul of those who died in that genocide remain in perfect peace. Uh, please, can we, as humanitarians, can we just observe this one minute silence for those who lost their lives, their families in this genocide that took place in Rwanda 1994? Please, can we just take one minute silence, please? Let's take that to honor all those humanitarians, all those lives, lives that lost. Please, Thank you very the much. time starts now, just one minute.
May their gentle souls rest in perfect peace in Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you very what much. A, what a terrible story. But we have all learned that it is beyond all what we have said so far with that intolerance. We cannot achieve all what we have been saying. So we have to tolerate ourselves. We have to tolerate ourselves. We have to tolerate ourselves. And let me quickly give the headers in the house opportunity to talk. At please, I'm just giving you two minutes. And if possible, if you can manage one minute, it will be okay for us. And let me start with Chief Chaplain Peter Smith, Rico, and let uh, Ambassador Brown be ready immediately after Chief Chaplain. You have to talk, please. And I'm still coming to my dear friend, uh, uh, Simona. Please, uh, Chief Chaplain. Just one minute, please. I don't know what the people know besides me being the chief chaplain. I am the chancellor of Regnum International University and College. I'm also a person that has been teaching with James now for quite a few years. But there's one thing that many people do not know. I am of the Jewish religion. I am a Jewish man in Puerto Rico, in the United States of America, teaching people in Africa and wherever James has requests for teaching, regardless of whether they're what religion, ABC religion, whatever religion, whatever color, whatever nationality, be they male and female. About two weeks or so ago, James informed me of this issue that I was listening to Claude today. And I will have to tell you, I don't think James has ever seen me take oxygen from an oxygen tank. But seeing this video made me have to take some oxygen. I was not prepared to see this video. And I, as a Jewish person, I'm aware of what atrocities could happen to people's religion, as happened in Schwarzenegger, uh, the Nazis against the Jewish people. To me, it is something that really destroyed me inside listening, but I stood fast and I listened. And I am extremely, extremely sorry that ever had to pass. But I hope in the teachings that I give, or the ceremonies or the activities that I am invited to give a lecture to, regardless of what it may be about chaplains, community projects, community services, and so forth, helps the people of Africa, regardless of whatever your religion, regardless of your ethnicity, and make sure that you have men and women at the training, because to me, any chaplain, be it male or female, are worth teaching. And I have found that out after hundreds of students being taught by me in Africa through James. May God bless Cloud, and may you remember, Cloud, you have a coming that's really coming to heart. Your present day and your story is extremely important. And I apologize for taking more than two minutes, but then again, I am known for never taking two minutes. I always talk a lot more. God bless and God bless all of you at Thank this you. meeting. Thank you so much, Chief Chaplain. That is wonderful coming from you. I know, and that's why I timed you because uh, you are a good orator. You can just pick it up from there and tomorrow we are still here listening to you. That's why I quickly gave you that some minutes. That I would like to call on the Ambassador Cotton Brown to hear from you. Please, what do you have to say? And what is the goodwill message from the Friends of African Union? Absolutely, absolutely. First, I want to uh, uh, give honor and praise to God Almighty. Uh, to heal uh, not only the African world, but the whole diaspora and all these people. First, I want to let you know who the Carlton Brown Foundation is. The Carlton Brown Foundation advocates sustainable development for people of the African Union, including its diaspora. 
The Carlton Brown Foundation is an Ohio non-reporting incorporated association organized chapter 1745 of the Ohio Revised Code organized on this date, January 2nd, 2018. Under the Revised Code, uh, assets to judgments and ex executions and other processes, all assets, property, funds, and any rights of interest of law and equity of such unincorporated associations should be subject to the judgment of execution and other processes. So what that means is that uh, I'm just like the crown of, of, of England, the, the queen, a non-incorporated association. Uh, Friends of the African Union, CC, Friends of the African Union has authorized Carlton Brown Foundation to advocate for economic, social well-being, and quality of life of people of the African Union and their communities with a focus on those who have low income through collective economic development action, civil society, cooperative actions, social media advocacy, transparent government actions, free and open elections, promoting education, and, and truth commissions based on science and proven facts, cooperation, promotion of the rule of law, fundamental human rights, based promotion of public-private partnership with governments that is supported of private firms owned in part and whole by African-Americans with an incentive that they can create jobs for African-Americans and Africans. I want to go on. Uh, to whom it may concern, to whom it, it, it might concern, this is Friends of the African Union, a United Nations Civil Society EPOSOC joint venture partner with New Future Foundation, which is Dr. Queen Mother uh, Dolores Blakely, who is the lead civil society of our stakeholders, appointed by the chairman. Uh, uh, for people of African descent. New Future Foundation, you can go up to Facebook or just Google her. Uh, New Future Foundation, you can go to, I want all the African ladies, especially the Africans in America, to go up to FAU Women. You'll see a gold seal with a woman on it. You need to go up there and get, get with them. We have a queen mother, and she also is the queen mother of Ashanti through the official rights, and so is uh, Queen Mother Dr. Dolores Blakely, who studied under Queen Mother Moore for the reparations of the African world. Okay, we're going to go on. Uh, a venture partner with New Future Foundation established in 2014 who created the African diaspora of this document of the, the, the UN's Africa Week 2017-21 annual session working group of experts of people of African descent, which are organized by the offices of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, 20 to the 24th, 2017 in Geneva, Switzerland, as our response to the report of the working group of experts on people of African descent on its mission to the USA. We're gonna go on. Hey. The study, the study to study problems of racial discrimination faced by people of African descent living in the diaspora and to that end, gather the relevant information from governments like I'm doing right now. I will be reporting to the chairman for solutions, especially to Britain and France. We have FAU France, we have all of y'all up there, FAU Nigeria, FAU South Africa, FAU Rwanda, FAU Ethiopia. We have organized the whole diaspora. They are on board. We have uh, the 750 kingdoms organized already. The Attica Kingdom Alliance. And uh, we're, we're about that change. Uh, you can go up to, well, wait a minute. Let me go ahead. To propose Thank measures you, to ensure full effective access to the justice system by people of African descent to submit recommendations on the design, implement, implementation, and enforcement of measures uh, to eliminate racial profiling of people of African descent, to make proposals 
on the elimination of racial discrimination against Africans and people of African descent in all parts of the world. To address all issues concerning the well-being of Africans and the African uh, and people of African descent contained in the Durban Declaration and Programming of Action. To elaborate short, medium, and long-term proposals for elimination of racial discrimination against people of African descent, bearing in mind the need for, for close collaboration at international development institutions and specialized agencies of the United Nations system to promote human rights of people of African descent through inter ala for all for the following activities. Improve human rights situations of people of African descent by devoting special attention to their needs through inter ala the preparation of specific programming of action. Design special projects in collaboration with the people of African descent to support their initiatives at the community level and to facilitate an exchange of information and te technical know-how between these populations and experts in these areas. Liaison with financial and development institutions, operational programming, specialized agencies of the United Nations with a view to to co contribute to the development of programming intended for people of African descent by allocating additional investments to health systems, education, housing, electricity, drinking water, environment control measures, and promoting equal opportunities in employment as well as other affirmative or positive measures and strategies within the human rights framework. In 2014, Human Rights Council, HRC, on 26th of September 2014, with resolution, HRC extended the mandate for the working group for three years. We're going to go on. You know, I'm just summarizing right now. It says, and then I will explain some solutions that Thank we Thank you so much. We don't have much time. Do. Yes, I'm sir. Brown. We don't have much time. Okay. This is one page here, and I will speak to you about how we're going to finance this initiative. We support the African Union and its constituted act and history of predecessor organizations of the African Union, the OAU. We support the recognition of the African diaspora globally and legally by the African Union. We support the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights in its application to Africans and their condition worldwide. We support the United Nations Millennial Development Goal for Africa and the economic social uplift of Africans on the continent and in the African diaspora as well as work of the African Union in regards to increasing trade between Africans, nations, and, and incorporate the work and international Europe for people of African descent as it is, it was designed by the United Nations Organization of, of American States. We support the strategy and agenda of the Economic, Social, and Culture Council, ECOSOC, and through organizations of African American Civil Society, we support the legacy projects, continuing efforts to strengthen the Global African Diaspora Initiative in the African Union. We support peace, security, basic human dignity within Africa and around the globe, with an emphasis on stopping slavery in the African Union and the African diaspora. We support organizations of the African Union and, Africa, uh, and peoples of African descent, self-interest and uplift through committee structure and responsibility for organizing such in the United States of America. We support the African Growth and Opportunity Act of 2000 and by 2014, the creation of a new plan between the United States of America and the African Union that is supportive of the African diaspora in the USA and, and would be sustainable not only for Africa, but also for host countries of the African diaspora. 
We support political empowerment of Africans and individual citizens and free associations and cooperate, uh, cooperation and solidarity in the continent and in the diaspora. We support the creation of the American Diaspora Holding Company and Investment Trust, who will start with creating a financial solution in response to the damages caused by Hurricane Sandy through the U.S. Federal Reserve Banks. So uh, what I want to talk to you about is how do we fund this? You know, how do we implement this process of change where not only do we help the African people worldwide, we help all races, right? Uh, and how we do this is we unify. We come together. We have implemented a global African goal initiative. Uh, you can go up to call me, email me, or go up to Friends of the Permanent Forum of People of African Descent, which has been an indigenous committee put in the United Nations now that well, people of, of African descent from all over the world can come. Uh, we have organized a council of males who are also on that permanent form. Uh, we'll be meeting here soon. Uh, you can come up to the page. Uh, you have a link for friends of the African Union.com. Uh, just go up there. You got to connect with the chairman. Right? Now, we have implemented this global African goal and how you access it is invest and uh, we are organizing entertainment. We are organizing the people of America. We are working with African countries who have already made their goals available. I, I, I don't want to name the two countries because you have to come up and talk to the chairman. You are already there, Brother Mercy. And uh, we're about that change, right? Now, we are about domestic implementation of human rights. Okay, how does this work for the African people? Well, it works for the African people like this. We are creating, we are having countries creating bureaus at this moment. We already have people ready to launch the bureaus. The bureaus are up. That's why we have FAUs throughout the world up on friendsoftheafricanunion.com. And the people in that country have 51% ownership and everybody in the country gets a visa call. And when the African gold has gone through its cycle, we have an FAU Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Mr. Andrew is very aware of this. He is that system that makes it work. We are united. We are, he is my leadership. He can explain that to you if he got permission from the chairman too. But what it is, Bermuda has the same exchange rate as the United States. Okay, as the African dollar, right? So we have our system going through that chamber of commerce, going through him, and it circulates, and everybody will receive visa cards, right? And first, the initiative to start out is to get the African leaders to invest, to get the African people who have the funds to invest. Uh, you go up to the 30 day plan on the global website and you receive 25% on your money in 30 days. If you don't have a visa card, a visa card will be sent to you. You will receive a confirmation email. Uh, nobody gives you 20, it's just gold. Gold does not depreciate. Thank you, I think uh, God is helping us. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Brown. Your mic is mute, and I think the girls did that. Your mic is mute. Okay, go up, go up to 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 the page. Email me. I'll send you the link to the website. Yes. You know, you just can't go to then Global you Africa Go. You won't connect all the way in. What you do yes. is you go into the site. You go to the bottom of the page. You call my leadership, right? Because. They are the implementers of this process. Not only is it going to be people investing, but all of these resources, and we already get the gold reserves. So uh, 
uh, thank with you so the much, deal with Ambassador Brown. Thank you so much. We really enjoy and we really appreciate you. And I'm glad to announce to you that you have taken uh, the place of another five speakers. So you have spoken, you have already spoken for five persons. So we are calling it short from here. And uh, because I have mentioned your name, my dear Honorable Simona, so I'm going to listen to you because I've mentioned your name earlier. If not so, you will have been the number of those that <laughs> Ambassador Brown has spoken for. Thank so you. let's go ahead, please. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Good morning. Again. Good morning to everyone. My name is Simona Tahiliani, and I'm the citizen of America, United States of America, and beautiful Europe. Uh, I actively volunteer in the education and human rights, and also healthcare, education, and Christian ministry. I have participated in different missions like um, for American Red Cross, so called Nature, and at this moment in the United States Institute of Democracy and Human Rights. I travel and educate others on the importance of education, self care, human rights, and embracing diverse cultures. Um, in working and um, facing different challenges, uh, we see harmony and equal opportunities for everyone. Uh, peace means understanding, empathy, and dialogue, no violence. Equity ensures no discrimination based on gender, race, or religion. Uh, together, peace and equity transform all the society around the world where conflict are resolved, need to be resolved by diplomacy and making sure that everyone has access to the learning, to the education, healthcare, and also voting and have the voice be here. Uh, achieving uh, very important things, demand leadership, accountability, uh, yeah. dismantling any kind of barriers which there are in the family, in the neighborhood, in the education system, on any kind of institution or between government. Uh, we must uh, prioritize um, education and diplomacy and foster understanding between people, doesn't matter color, religion, belief, or orientation, and empower the magnificent in a human being and build a future where peace and equity prevail. Uh, the peace is the guiding force on the air and beyond the understanding and empathy and dialogue, triumph over the violence, over misunderstanding, over the prejudices and over deeds and evil. Let us extend all call to everyone and inviting them to join us the noble pursuit of peace on the air and space and other celestial body or other life form which God created. Warm greetings to the African continent and I extend my helpful, grateful attitude for inviting me to the chat of things and all the participants and um, engaged to the discussion was wonderful. Thank you so much. Simona Tahiriani, active uh, director of the United States Institute of Democracy Thank and you. Human Rights in Francisco chapter. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was so quite a moderate and wonderful speech from uh, Simona, my very good friend. Thank you so much. I want to quickly acknowledge the presence of uh, Ambassador Humanitarian Emmanuel Etu and the uh, presence of Moro Benedict David Chaplin and uh, Chaplin Moses uh, Phillips and others that are here with us, I uh, acknowledge your presence. Uh, distinguished humanitarian Rizikat you, Yusuf, I uh, acknowledge your presence. Uh, Mrs. Margaret, you. I acknowledge your presence. Chaplin Linda, I acknowledge your presence. And others that are joining us here too, I quite acknowledge your presence. Thank you so much for joining us today in today's uh, program. And uh, I would like to announce to us that very shortly, we are going to invite us again to another very uh, powerful conference, which is going to be World Humanitarian Day that is coming up August 19th, World Humanitarian Day. So it's going to be, we're going to be more here and we are going to have another physical conference here in Nigeria where we're going to award 
all our humanitarians, those that has been, you know, been to humanitarianism. It has been a day to honor them, to recognize them. So I want to prepare your mind for that period. And uh, we'll also call for support when the time comes, because we want to make it more elaborate for others to come in. And uh, do not forget, this is coming from World Humanitarian Organization for Peace and Equity. And our motto is togetherness in humanitarianism because we believe we cannot do it alone. We believe we are to complement the work of that of the government, of the United Nations, of the Friends of African Union, of the African Union, and so many organizations like that. We are here to complement all your efforts and to work together with you. And that's why our motto is togetherness in humanitarianism. So we are there to support, we are there to work together. And I want to officially thank you all for participating in this program, for joining us here today to be part of the success we have recorded today in this uh, conference, living together in peace. And uh, today we learn from what we heard from Rwanda, that it is always good to be together. It is always good to live together in peace and to tolerate each other. And if there's any offense or something, let's learn how to forgive easily, at least for peace to reign. So thank you so much for joining us. I must say thank you. Please, if you are here on this platform and you are hiding your face, we want you to show your face right now because we want to take pictures. Please, wherever you are, if you can take pictures, please take now and make sure you send those pictures to me. Please take pictures now, take pictures, and make sure you send those pictures to me personally. Take pictures wherever you are, make sure you smile. This is a good picture going viral, going to other places. Please, if you can take picture, take now. Take your picture now. If you are still hiding your face, only while you're on camera. Pictures. Always show their faces. Yes. Elijah, why are you hiding before? Elijah Rizika, why are you hiding? Beautiful faces must be shown. Beautiful faces must be shown. Nobody should hide. So let us all come out and show our faces with good smile. If you are taking pictures, please take now. Take your picture now. James, showing that James, we are together. it's like saying, come out of the closet and stop hiding. Yes, coming out of your closet. Stop hiding. Thank you so much all for coming. Take your pictures, take your pictures. It has been a wonderful day. This is an international day of living together in peace. We have people from different countries, different parts of the world. And here we are together in peace, in oneness, in harmony. There's nothing good than this. And uh, this is what we should promote wherever we are and to make sure, make sure that we maintain peace at all times. I remain your anchor for today and the host for this, today's program. I am Ambassador Dr. James Messi of Batumibi, the Chief Executive Officer of World Humanitarian Organization for Peace and Equity. And I'm happy I'm having other, uh, other officials here, the board members, the advisory board, Chief Chaplain Peter Smith, and I also have an honorable ambassador here, Elijah, Elijah Rizikat. He's, she's also a board member, honorable board member. And I also thank you for all joining us here. And uh, the Chief General Chaplain has helping us from worries also here. So thank you for joining us. And uh, now I'll be bringing Ambassador Cotton Brown on board, coming to the board membership very soon. So all these are, uh, a pesos and uh, you know that he has given us today. You'll be able to be given that more in our frequent programs. So prepare yourself, Ambassador Cotton Brown, for more episodes, for more gospel, for more preaching, for more whatever you have to put together to meet to the heart of the people. So thank you so much. It's so blessing to have you all today. So thank you. I appreciate you. Appreciate. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much, sir. We appreciate Thank you. you so much for coming. Thank you so much. Beautiful. We appreciate everyone. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate everyone. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Happy trails bye. to you all. Be Thank safe. You. May the force be with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming.